Hey everybody, it's Talk Gnosis. We're talking about philosopher and theologians of own day. And joining me is Emily Russo. Hello, Emily. Hello. And Dr. Nina Power. Hi, Dr. Power. Hi, Nina. Hi. <laughs> uh, both returning champions. Fantastic to have you both <laughs> on here. Uh, two uh, poets, philosophers, professors. So three Ps, as well as writers. I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you both do party tricks. There's a four P. Lots of very interesting people who do lots of interesting things. We'll be talking about that as well. But before we get to things that people care about and are interested a commercial for our Patreon, paypal.com slash Gnostic. For as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can help us keep the show going. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.be slash Gnostic. So please help us out financially if you can. It allows us to literally do the show as well as uh, allow me to sign back up for Nina's podcast and buy Emily's books. So <laughs> definitely, definitely donate. And I understand if you can't help us out financially, I'm often there my spot myself. So tell people about the show, like and subscribe, rate. You know, I you consume online media. If you didn't, you wouldn't be listening or watching to this. So the reason why all of us annoying people, chances are you have a podcast or a YouTube show. So you know that the liking and the subscribing and the rigmarole roll, it feeds the algorithm, and the algorithm lifts things up and they get noticed. And that's, that's the game. So uh, help us play the game. Okay. Uh, Emily and Nina. Who, who was Simone Bay? If you could give us sort of a, a brief outline, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, the, the just the facts. <laughs> well, uh, John, as you, as you know, I, I, uh, I struggle with facts, um, but uh, let, let us say what we, we do know briefly. And of course, this is not exhaustive. So, so Simone Bay, uh, 1909 to 1943. So she in a way is sort of in the the first half of the 20th century, which as we know is, is kind of filled with war, it's filled with deracination and violence and, uh, and various kinds of uh, nihilism. She is born uh, into uh, a fairly uh, wealthy uh, family. Um, she's Jewish, she's very intellectual, she's very uh, also committed to workers' struggles. She kind of moves around in the world um, between a sort of practical uh, relation and a kind of intellectual relation. And those two, I think, are not really separated in her life. She she goes to Germany to try to understand what is happening uh, there. Um, I think probably her most famous text, The Need for Roots, which is published after um, her death. Um, and most of her work is kind of fragmentary. It's sort of notebooks and uh, almost kind of aphorisms, um, particularly gravity and grace, um, is is a kind of uh, a part of a project for trying to imagine what France in this case would have been like after the war. So she she is commissioned to write this uh, very uh, ultimately very strange, very beautiful, very philosophical, very mystical, religious, and poetic text. Um, but it's basically supposed to be a policy document. <laughs> and I think Charles de Gaulle, who, who ultimately was responsible for commissioning it, uh, declares it her mad and, and you know, it's, it's a very useless document from his point of view. Um, but I think she is always interested, I think, particularly in questions of labor. What does it mean to work? Um, and in the context, not only of uh, creating a meaning um, but also in the face of the kind of um, dehumanization of labor and the kind of mechanization processes of mechanization processes of bureaucratization. Um, now, obviously, we would see this perhaps in even more extreme ways in terms of forms of, you mentioned the algorithm. <laughs> um, uh, so in a way, I think she's fundamentally opposed to anything that detracts from uh, questions of beauty, of poetry, of meaning, but this does not make her, although she's sometimes described as a mystic, uh, I don't think this makes her um, removed from these questions. On the contrary, it is in the practice of working and thinking at the same time. And she talks all the time about how labour creates thought, um, that she uh, sort of begins to think or thinks through 
uh, religious questions often are new. But in, the, as I say, like in the context of the 20th century, where let's say the possibilities for these these forms of theological thought have been more or less um, seemingly destroyed by the nihilism induced by by war in the in the 20th century when she's uh, writing. Uh, Emily, do you have anything to, to add to that? Any uh, important points or biographical or philosophical things that are really important to know off the top of the uh, show? Um, I'm not sure if there's anything that's super important to know at the top of the show, but I guess I'll add um, that I feel like she's mostly kind of known for um, being, I guess she's often called like a Christian mystic as as nina kind of mentioned but she although she was she was born into a jewish family although not yeah. they didn't like practice uh, i don't think i think they were pretty agnostic um and she i don't i don't believe she ever like officially converted to christianity but um she and i think the other thing to know about her that people tend to know about her and kind of like whisper around about her is that she um is known for having for the way that she died at age 34 um, for, via to, like sort of tuberculosis, but then she chose not to eat. So I think the official kind of cause of death was starvation or, or suicide. Um, and, you know, throughout her life, I think that what Nina was saying in terms of like the lining up of the practical and the intellectual in her life uh, makes people think of her as as somewhat of a saint because these are very hard things to do like you know live the live the sort of live our ideas or whatever um and she did that she always she like not only wanted to understand the most oppressed but also live i guess live like them um and so yeah. her death was sort of associated with that so she she didn't want to to eat more than other people uh, at the time were eating yeah um can we go through what, what some people think of as some of her, her major areas of, of thought, uh, starting with, with absence and kenosis? Um, yeah, I mean, a few things to say. I mean, maybe maybe one thing to say about her style, as it were, and, and you know, having t taught a course on, on the need for roots, which is in a way much more um, direct than some of her other fragments. Um, but nevertheless, there's something about her method and her way of writing, which I think places it more like in the genre of like the Zen Cohen <laughs> or something like this, like like these, she often makes very kind of definitive sounding assertions, but they're the kinds of things that you, you need to sit with for a while. And it, so for example, in Gravity and Grace, the way in which some of the fragments are organized are in these, um, at least how they're, they're given to us um, under these various categories. So when we think about um, absence, I suppose, you know, one obvious question would be thinking theologically about how, if you like, perhaps we can only say something about God negatively, let's say, right? Very, you know, important um, uh, aspect. Um, we can say not only what God it is not or what hypothetically must not be but also the way in which through negation or through forms of silence or lack or um, emptiness um, that something is also conveyed um, and obviously these kinds of questions are being discussed a lot in the 20th century and in different ways I mean Heidegger is also very interested in questions of silence and whether silence can be a more authentic mode of communication um, for example, um, and we see this also in people like uh, Blanchot and Bataille, um, and there's a real exploration of, um, you know, try, trying, if you like, to protect those modes of communication or absence or lack or negation that themselves have um, significance uh, that goes beyond the symbolic, I suppose. And, and, and kenosis, I guess, in the sort of more technical sense, the idea that if you like, God gives up something by um, uh, making Jesus man, you know, the process of um, Jesus becoming human, if you like, um, so that divinity itself is not only incarnated, um, but then subject to all of the, the things that that would mean as, as, as uh, to, be, to, to be finite, to be mortal, but also to be 
um, part of God. And, and obviously Christianity um, has multiple ways of thinking through these kind of contradictions of, of finitude, infinitude, presence, absence, life, death, um, and so on. And I think they is very, very interested in going through these cracks, these kind of um, seeming contradictions or paradoxes or these um, these lacks and, and often I think this beautiful tension between the assertion but asserting something that is itself quite mysterious you know these are not she's not kind of writing out definitive axioms or making kind of uh, I don't know factual statements these are provocations I suppose on the basis of, of um, a certain commitment to uh, things that aren't there I, I guess uh, Emily, do you have anything to, to add or talk about uh, kenosis, emptiness, absence in Simone Weil's thought? Um, she does have this interesting way. She talks a lot about um, God creating the world through an act of pulling away um, or hiding away. Um, otherwise, there would be nothing but God. So there is a sense in which, like, um, we can only exist where God is not, which I, I think is quite quite interesting and recurs a lot in different ways. And as you know, was saying like through via these like sort of fragments or koans. And I think this is why also a lot of my a lot of like poet people I know tend to like know and read and love Simone Bay and not as I mean I don't really know that many philosophers or people who call themselves philosophers, but there, it, I, she's not taught as much. So I was like quite happy when Nina taught the class on her because. She's quite hard to categorize, and so I think this is why, like, the poets among us are kind of drawn to her um, in this way. But yeah, there is this sort of act of withdrawal, um, and so we, the created, are what and where God is not. Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, perhaps I mean, John. This, I, you know, I, I wonder if they how they would fit into a kind of Gnosticism. You know, whether in a sense she she has uh gnostic tendencies i mean the way em emily was just talking there about the uh, it's almost like the judaic idea of the kind of absence of of you know the broken pots or how, how to reconstruct the universe through its kind of brokenness um you know and, and whether there is something in Ve that that offers something of a gnostic uh view um at least in her description yeah, I, I, I would definitely say so, just from that description and the limited reading that I've done. But I, I think anybody listening or watching at home, right, if, if they are familiar with Kabbalah or particularly Lurianic Kabbalah, uh, the, the forms of Kabbalah that are sort of close to whatever Gnosticism is, uh, I, I think that this description of, of God's withdrawing at the beginning of creation is, is very Gnostic. Um, mm -hmm. And the sort of, the fact that creation reality itself is sort of constituted by this by by this process of absence uh is i think very very gnostic mm -hmm. um emily can you can you tell us about affliction um not in general but in simone pay's uh thought <laughs> oh i can tell you about affliction um so affliction <laughs> is an interesting word for her because she she sort of says that it's um it's the i think she describes it as the great mystery of life it's related to suffering but it's it's almost like a a more intense version of suffering or an offshoot of suffering that's quite sharp um and it makes things unbearable in some way and she kind of describes it in this interesting almost like geometric she has this like very cosmically geometric way of describing things um mm. so she says at one point um that uh, affliction is like a sort of technique of the divine and it's a, a device um, to introduce to the soul of, you know, a creature, uh, this kind of um, immensity of force or coldness or brutality. And that, that it sort of um, makes, makes us then submit or consent to a uh, to a, a zone to the, this world in which like we're not in like we're not in charge you know so the, it's like this terrible thing that's ultimately uh, meant to help us realize something about uh, our our powerless our powerlessness or something um, 
in the face of of, of, of affliction, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. That's my it understanding does. of it, anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nina, do you, do you have anything to say about uh, affliction in the Veian sense? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's an interesting question, not, not just in Bay, but also in, in I suppose, Bataille, and even going back to Nietzsche about the, the kind of diagnosis of asceticism. Like, you know, what does it mean to sort of choose asceticism as a kind of mode of, of being? Obviously, Nietzsche has some very critical things to say about that. But I think in ba um, Bataille and Vey, if you like, there is almost, and I think Bataille met Vey at some point. Um, I think he thought she was like, uh, very strange. <laughs> was also, I think, kind of like fascinated by her. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He's kind of very intrigued, but I think he thinks that he, she's almost like the kind of anti Bataille in some, or like she's like the pole, the other pole, where Bataille stresses excess. Um, you know, they, you know, not only, of course, Emily mentioned her, her death, you know, and the, the kind of self uh, refusal, the, you know, the self denial, the kind of, you know, not wanting to have more rations than the other workers, not wanting to ever kind of uh, take take too much and, and this kind of thing, which is really the flip side of excess, you know, I mean, to be um, very ascetic is also to be kind of very extreme as well, right? And um, so, you know, and then I think Nietzsche makes this point, but so she, she, and I, one thing I really want to stress actually, maybe I didn't make clear enough before is like, she is so fundamentally opposed to what she perceives to be the ever encroaching, I suppose, utilitarian approach to life. Like the, the fact that everything can be measured, the fact that everything, uh, is for something else, you know, that everything is a means to an end, you know, so she's very, very, um, definitive that something like suffering or affliction is not for anything else like it's not like useful you know like it, it is what it is um she says you know i should not love my suffering because it is useful i should love it because it is you know that there is no other um uh way of reincorporating it back into any kind of you know evaluative quantitative system somehow it's like what what lies outside um, of those tendencies, which we are co completely dominated by now, more, more, even more so, right, than in the early 20th century. Yeah, I, I'd say so for for sure. I, I think really the dominant philosophy of our time is uh, utilitarianism, mm. and almost to an obsessive amount. And I, I think people are are shocked or and surprised when when they realize how much they're dominated by it. Uh, I, I've experienced that myself, or even when I'm speaking to people. Uh, and you know, I'm talking about very philosophical, artistic uh, individuals. Where and of course, it's also very freeing to realize that you can do something, and there doesn't have to be a uh, a uh, positive measurable uh, point to it. But but I think particularly with, with her idea about uh, affliction, this is particularly radical because I think people c could and do understand suffering, particularly in a re religious context, as having this this purpose, this mm. meaning that there's, there's something that you can always directly get out of it, right? Uh, so it's a very transactional understanding of, of suffering. I, I would say that if, if people who sort of even if they're not devoutly religious, even if they lean spiritually, would uh, would sort of have this as as a preset when they're trying to figure out uh, suffering and affliction in the world. Um, I do not know Simone uh, Vey's work very well. Uh, it really sounds like I should, and of course now I'm fascinated. And there is an excellent archived course that I can take, so I can I can know more in the future. We'll be talking about that shortly. But uh, for now, my my Wikipedia uh, listing of of her work. Uh, the next is the Platonic uh, concept of uh, meta meta shoe meta zoo. How do I how do I say it? Do you folks know uh, the Platonic middle ground? Um, can, does anybody want to talk to me about that? How do you pronounce that word? I would say metaxu, but that's what I was saying. Okay, yeah. But I, but you know, I don't know. Like with a lot of ancient Greek words, in the best possible way, like people don't really know how to pronounce them. Like honestly, <laughs> that's not just a democratic thing to say. It's like most of the time, it's just convention, and I, I, you know, I think people are kind of assholes if they go around like, you know, really definitively correcting people's pronunciation when we don't know. Um, <laughs> so you can say it however you like. <laughs> my liberal, my liberal dispensation. <laughs> well, now that we've established that, Anita, can you tell me what it is? 
yeah i i mean i think it's kind of quite uh as, as far as i sort of would think about it um it's it's something like the as i i don't know like a kind of middle uh, uh a middle space like um that that perhaps if you think about how we are situated um qua humanity like if, if you say for example we're between angels and animals or we're between earth and sky or we're between good and bad or you know that there's something kind of fundamentally mixed about us or or uh matter and spirit or you, you know what i mean like that there is we are not um definitively something right we're not gods we're not god we might be a fragment of god we might be part of god it depends on how you think of it if you have like a spinozist concept conception then we are like a mode of of god um or you know we retain a, a god-like aspect like a spark or something like this but um at the same time we are we don't know exactly what we're for <laughs> like we we might have a telos but it's not evident right and and in a way this is the beautiful thing right precisely because if we did then we would be automatons we would be golems we would be programmed we would be determined you know we can't we can't uh um easily identify our blueprint in a certain way so we, we but we sometimes suffer from this kind of ambiguity and this ambivalence and i think you know today we see a lot of this absolute desperate human need for um a kind of manichaean worldview like the idea that there is good and there is bad and you and somehow we can look at the universe and take our cue and we can say this this thing is good and this thing is bad you know it's a very very deep tendency to kind of binarize uh things and augustine talks about this in the confessions um when he moves from manichaeanism to to uh christianity and, and Christianity's great solution in some ways, as Hegel points out, is to introduce the Trinity, is to introduce almost like a kind of um, uh, various forms of mediation and negative determination and this kind of way that um, you don't have to <laughs> live with this black and white, good, bad um, thing, but rather understand um, complexity. And obviously the incarnation of Christ as a man, but also as, as the son of God um, introduces this as does the spirit or the Holy Ghost. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, before Christianity, um, you still have this kind of idea that um, there is a process of becoming and that we are in this kind of flux or this ambivalent middle state, um, if you like, not, not, not quite knowing where we are um, going. And I, I think it's, it's, it's obviously a kind of useful um, concept for um, Simone Weil and, and I, I guess just to mention you know how educated how well educated and how well read Weil is you know she's reading the ancient Greek she's reading you know classics philosophy mathematics you know science she literature she's you know extraordinarily I mean she dies obviously very young as Emily said but she you know she's sort of super um yeah I don't know autodidactic as well as well educated and so she's bringing in all of these kind of uh, ancient forms of wisdom she kind of fuses syncretically um, lots of different traditions which today would be like seen as I don't know very unfashionable and like you know not appropriate you can't you can't do that everything is segregated and everything is uh, separate disciplinarily so yeah so I think again with the kind of um, almost the Zen like uh, uh, Cohen style so in the Metaxu uh, section in Gravity and Grace she says things like the world this world is the closed door it is a barrier and at the same time it is the way through you know again it's like this kind of yeah Kaf kafka-esque uh zen cohen or something like this you know um yeah that's how i would think of it cool well uh, that emily do you uh do you have any uh commentary on the uh meta wait i'm gonna put in a few more uh <laughs> syllables there the metax the, the metax ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> um <laughs> well yeah i mean yeah i think i love this i love the way she talks about Metaxu. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's just sort of this, the way that she thinks about our world, the material world, but also the way that I find it most, I guess, um, uh, helpful to think about is as almost a kind of medium. So like the, that thing about a, the closed door being a barrier, but also the way through. 
uh, there's something about that. That's the way like tech, all technology works or all mediums work. Uh, you know, there's like there's sig signal and noise and there's different kinds of transmission. And sometimes there's it's a block and sometimes it makes us more than we are and sometimes it makes us less. Um, and so I think that's, that's how I think about it. But there's also, yeah, I mean, she also, I'm not sure if it's in that section, but she, she talks about a similar thing, uh, like two prisoners uh, who are communicating with each other um, uh, on either side of a wall. They communicate by knocking on the wall. And like, so the wall is that which separates them, but it's also how they, commune um mm. and then she says it's the same with humans and god like every every everything that separates that like there's that door everything that separates is also what we're communicating through or knocking on mm. and so in every like range of that or spectrum would be true like sometimes maybe it's muffled or sometimes it's coming in clear sometimes we can't even find the door um so this this kind of world is both blockage and passage or something yeah, I, I think that's really good. It reminds me of that very short Jean Genet film, the um, Enchant de Moor, where the two men are in prison, they're at the other side of a wall, but there's a hole in the wall and one smokes a cigarette and the smoke comes out through the hole mm -hmm. in the other side. It's a very beautiful short film. Um, yeah, it just that, that image came to mind as you were speaking. And I, I think this, yeah, this thing about like mixed they're all these kind of medium-sized concept or, or mix, mixed ideas and I, I, she says here um, you know no human being should be deprived of his metaxu that is to say of those relative and mixed blessings home country traditions culture etc which warm and nourish the soul and without which short of sainthood a human life is not possible and I think the, this is really important because when you look at the need for roots there's something kind of almost if you read it a particular way almost kind of conservative or traditional or um, even reactionary about the kinds of things that Vey is saying when she's talking about patriotism and country and the idea of, of, of you know, she's obviously criticizing deracination and she's talking about the need for place. Um, and I think today we're often, we're sort of taught to be very suspicious of these kinds of ideas as if we are somehow um, we have to go along lock, stock and barrel with a sort of liberal cosmopolitanism, deracination, no, this is just how it is. And anyone who talks about those things must be sort of conservative, if not actively right wing. And I think Vey is also really important precisely for offering um, a non right wing defense of, of these things. You know, the fact that there is um, a need for place, for meaning, for community, for, you know, all of these sorts of things like medium sized things, which are themselves ambivalent, right? So it's not like you have to say, oh, I'm British, therefore I'm proud of, you know, being British, right? But nevertheless, there is a kind of reality to that claim, you know, there's, there's the arbitrary nature of being born in a particular place, but there is also a reality of what it means to belong in inverted commas um somewhere and what happens when people are kind of dispossessed of any kind of rootedness um so i think she she offers like a kind of way out sometimes of some of these sort of su supposedly entrenched political um divisions yeah i yeah, totally no. i totally agree i think um she's like radical in this in the etym etymology yeah it's like it's a, about like like i think she's she's and she's very critical in a need for roots of, of like the sort of endless stream of progress without rootedness and that sort of makes a society and individuals ill which i think we see right now i mean we have a kind of every all everyone of all sides have a sort of deranged relationship to the past it seems so yeah I, I simone yeah i totally agree she offers this like interesting way out like we're not even yeah i mean it's sort of it makes a lot of sense she, she just she makes sense um which i don't not a lot of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which almost nobody does today, <laughs> including ourselves <laughs> in our derangement. Mm -hmm. Totally true. <laughs> uh, Emily, uh, you mentioned appreciating her as a poet, that, that you know a lot of poets who like her because uh, Simone Weil's aesthetics. Can, can you talk to us about uh, the aesthetics and beauty and the meaning of beauty in, in her work? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, she says she has this very interesting um, 
through line in her work that has to do with uh, looking and eating. Um, mm. the, the distant sense, the sort of quote unquote intellectual sense of sight and the close sense of eating. Uh, she says that beauty pro beauty is a promise. It, it doesn't give, but it promises. And so it creates a kind of hunger. Um, but, and so, so in that way, it kind of drives us and it creates desire, but um, we cannot uh, sort of look and eat at the same time. We can't desire and consume at the same time um, because uh, obviously if we were to consume that which we found beautiful, that thing would change into something else, you know? So it's this um, problem that we have on this plane. And she says it's like only in the beyond that looking and eating are the same operation. Um, and so this like doubleness again, this sort of tension, uh, she almost like a lot of her work, I, th I think resides in this tension between like distance and proximity or how to kind of look without consuming. She also says like, we, we tend to love like cannibals. We sort of devour what we love and, um, and, how, and, and how to not do that, how to kind of hold that, that tension or something that we're all, we already have to hold because we are on this plane where um, we have these separate senses. Mm. So I tend, yeah, I'm very interested in, in how she talks about beauty um, a, as a kind of operation that both pleases and maybe torments a bit or something. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, I think just to, to go back to the sort of political point, I mean, beauty is one of these very complicated concepts because on the face of it, it's um, manifestly asymmetrical and, and unjust and um, not distributed fairly. And I'm actually kind of interested in almost like a kind of communism of beauty. Like what would it mean to sort of be able to redistribute beauty or to see beauty um, everywhere or that there would be enough beauty for people in the world if you said i mean and of course we we attach beauty to often to human beings but you know in a way that much of the world is very beautiful you know if you if you um enjoy nature and birds and you know <laughs> um you can you can look for kind of signs and then and, and see beauty um even in kind of uh i don't know for in, in desolation um, and I, yeah, I think it would be very interesting to construct almost like a politics of beauty from from Bay, and because it does have this absent quality, both in its experience, as Emily says, but also in the um, how it appears to us, how it is manifested, and what the lack of beauty kind of does to to people, to us, if we're not, if we we are not encountering beauty in the world, you know, the deprivation that is there actually from this absence of beauty is very very profound it's not a minor aspect of existence you know it's 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 very very important that there is beauty yeah um the god thing you know what did she say to do about god do with god you know should should people be trying to get closer to god should people be trying to do something with this god thing tell us about that please Oh gosh, I <laughs> I don't think there's a straightforward answer to this this question. Um, I I think that there is. <sighs> I th I think to go back to the earlier points we were making about absence and about this, you know, that that is not. It's never going to be as simple as saying, well, I'm a Christian, therefore everything is solved, right? I mean, we already know this from Kierkegaard and and there are many other thinkers in an existential vein that it's a declaration of faith is in no way a substitute for the lived experience of what it might mean to struggle with with faith and belief um and i think the way they talks about god is in this kind of hopeful way in in the in the absence of um a strong or at least socially based belief right the idea that somehow going to church is therefore sufficient to be a christian which of course it is not that i think she's in that tradition of um becoming religious if you see what i mean like that, that to be to be faithful is to be in a permanent and often crisis ridden process of coming to terms with absence and lack and um and so on but nevertheless remaining in 
um, in communication with God somehow. But it, it, is, a, it's, it is a torturous <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Emma Lee, do you, do you have anything to say about this torturous thing? <laughs> this torturous thing. Yeah, that's the name of the podcast. Um, I think you know. Yeah, I mean, it's like being willing to look at what, or not even being willing. We must look at what sucks. I guess would be like the the way I would put it in a shorthand. You know, I think she really, her way of getting at God or whatever, getting close to God, um, it has to do with sliding the self out of the way. Mm. And she says it's not. For me to think about myself it's for god to think about me um and so i think w immediately when you asked this question i was thinking about this idea that we hear now a lot of this, of like sort of being at the center of one's life or being the main character in one's story and i think maybe that you know kind of nixing that notion would be how a way to get closer to god in in the simone bay sense um and and, and sort of getting to the edge of, of one's surrounding so that you can see what's going on, uh, not through uh, just your own life experience or something. Um, and so just like looking around, you know, I think she's very much, as we were kind of talking about before, like a this world, like if she is a mystic, it's like a mystic of this world um, and like paying attention to this world and what's going on, especially that which is like hard to look at or um, that which we don't want to, don't feel like looking at. Um, yeah, and that's what's torment. That's why it's tormenting, uh, and we shouldn't like try to get rid of that torment, but like linger there. Uh, and that's really at the same, the place of beauty too. It's like sort of this mm. uh, suspension. Yeah, I, I think just to just to add to Emily's point correctly about the 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 kind of um, excavating the self or absenting the self in that sense. I mean, and it's it is physical labor that they suggests if you like is the 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 spiritual um the most fundamental kind of spiritual practice if you like you know it's not sitting in in prayerful contemplation or or something like that even though that that might also be i mean it's clearly something that we we are capable of doing qua human but it is in this um yes there's a, almost like this evacuation of the self and the ego through physical labor that we are at our most spiritual so it is in a, in a, in the most um directly physical practical you know you could say debased uh forms of modes of acting that we are uh the most spiritual or the or in the most religious um what else uh, that is not on the list that that is important to you when it comes to simone Fay's? Uh, thought and uh, I'm leaving that open ended. And I know with with panels, uh, you know, there can be that awkward silence when you're trying to think and who's going to speak first. But I, I can edit that out, or I can make it longer. I can make it like a ten minute silence. But anyway, so what's I'm into like the 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 online silences. Yeah, what? <laughs> but what is there? Is there one that I forgot, or or one that I left out, or or another uh, the topic area of thought that that really speaks to you personally? I think for me, it's the curious combination of the assertion and the um, hermetically sealed nature of her statements, you know, that they are not easily consumable, right? These are not sound bites. These are not memes. These are not like, you know, the clever witticism. These are, like I say, claims that are often made in a very, very strong way for which there is no evidence in the midwit reddit tier oh citation needed you know like it, they, then they simply don't operate in that way um and therefore require a particular mode of reception in their reading and contemplation which is itself a slowing down of thought so they have a kind of practical power in that way and i and not to reduce them to that either that they they kind of resonate, um, you know, she, like, for example, she, she, she says things like two forces rule the universe, light and gravity. And you go, all right, then, 
<laughs> what does it mean to think about that? Like, can I see the universe in the, you know, from my perspective in terms of light and gravity? Uh, all right. Like, you know, this is like a kind of sitting in the park for eight hour type of exercise, right? You know, and, and in that sense, I just think it's, it's amazing, right? Like it's sort of, uh, so so profound and so strange and it's it's not like she's asking you to like agree with her or to you know this is not a form of logical argumentation it is a series of like insights perhaps often generated let's say in mystic states and also what does it mean to be a mystic in the 20th century when everything is so you know physically there when we're in this in industrial warlike very real seeming world you know to 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 be a mystic in the 20th century is already like a very odd eccentric position to to have um yeah there's these kinds of things these provocations i suppose um nina I, the, you taught a uh, a gcast global center for advanced studies course on Simone Weil and her book, The Need for Roots. Now, I, I'm assuming that the GCAS has a fair amount of leeway when it comes to, to mm -hmm. topics. So, so why specifically Simone Weil and why specifically her book, Need for Roots? Yeah, I mean, I think just a word about the kind of just in general about, about GCAS would be part of this, but like this kind of this very interesting um, shift, I think, towards the para-academic or the post-academic. And I was thinking about it the other day and it's like, I only now teach to people who want to be there <laughs> if you see what i mean and it's not to suggest that everyone who goes to university is only doing it for some kind of useful functional reason but the whole structure now because of the fees and everything is set up in such a way that it kind of mitigates against people being in a position to even think because everyone's so anxious and so concerned about it so i i'm very interested in these forms of education or discussion even they're not even it's not it's not educative in the strict sense of like a master and disciples or whatever. It's it, these situations where people are only there because they want to discuss a particular book or a particular author. And it's sort of elective in that sense. And I also teach adult education to largely older retired people in London. And I love this mode of teaching, you know, because it is pure enthusiasm, right? It's pure desire and uh, you know, wonderful in that in that sense. So, I think what it was, why why we did it, and it was kind of during the lockdowns or around you know this this past two years that everyone is now pretending didn't happen somehow or blocking out. Um, is is partly to do with these questions, like I was saying, that the political attempt, the attempt to find a way out, I suppose, of this binary thinking. Uh, you know, sometimes binaries are useful. But the Manichaean, you know, left, right, good, bad thing, um, you know, I think a lot of people are like deeply impatient with. It, it doesn't even look like the old left, right <laughs> division. It's something else. And so uh, I'm, I'm very, very interested in these liminal figures who are often not taught directly in contemporary universities. So that would include Simone Bay. She might be taught here and there, but she's not generally a central figure in the in the history of how philosophy is taught. Um, or theology for that matter. Um, the same would go for people like Ivan Illich and Bataille and these figures who I think um, have a lot to say about where we have ended up, whether that's because of bureaucracy, technocracy, uh, uh, you know, the, the secularization of the world or, or whatever, we, however we would want to diagnose our current moment. So it's in a way looking for escape routes, I think from the usual frameworks of thinking. So yeah, again, it would be authors that break the frame that we we all um, internalize and is daily kind of repeated to us through media and through discourse. Um, so anything that snaps, breaks that and shatters it, I guess. Yeah. And uh, that course is still online in an archived form, I believe, if people want to to take it. Um, Emily, you have a new tome of poetry out, Confetti, mm -hmm. uh, emilyrusso.com slash confetti. Uh, and it has some, some Simone Fay content. Uh, specifically, where does where does she and her, her work and her ideas pop up in this book? 
Um, well, I guess I'll just say first, I took Nina's class. It was a very good class. Highly, highly recommend. <laughs> um, well, Emily was an excellent, you know, participant as, as well. You know, very beautiful. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, confetti. Um, it's funny that you said tome. Um, yeah, it's so it's out officially September 1st. Um, but yeah, you can pre-order it from Hyperidian Press. Um, how does Simone, yeah, Simone Veit, so I was inspired by this podcast to um, count how many times she appears in Confetti, and it's like, I think nine, um, which is kind of a lot, you know, it's kind of a lot for a, like 200 page book of, of poems, um, but a lot of like figures appear throughout it. And so, um, you know, Confetti, I guess, is um, a book about film like film as a medium, but also film as a material, a sort of filminess or an in-betweenness that kind of blocks and reveals. Um, so I guess it's sort of similar to like uh, Metaxu, though I don't talk about that concept. Um, so like I'm talking a lot in the book about like light, both LED and sun, um, and like our changing relationship to screens and light and such. And so, um, she she sort of shows up as a figure who's talking about light in various mm. ways. Um, she has really interesting things to say about light. Um, she says at one point that love is not consolation, it is light. And I find this very, uh, I'm sort of fascinated by this and it, it figures in the book because, you know, if, if love is not consolation, it is light, then we have to start thinking, we have to think like, okay, well, what kind of light might not be consoling and what is the full spectrum and range of light that we're dealing with um mm. i mean just on this point i mean one of the other amazing claims she makes about in relation to light which i think a lot of people pick up on is this she says there is only one fault incapacity to feed upon light for where capacity to do this has been lost all faults are possible you know and I, again that kind of puts her in a um even a sort of yeah the a kind of mystic tradition really which for which light is is a central feature you know that there is a kind of um uh yeah and i think i think emily's question about well what what kind of light are we talking about you know what is the quality of light is it natural light is it sunlight is it you know yeah artificial light i mean these are all questions that are like triggered i think by this this um again like uh underdetermined concept in vain like she it, it's open for that reason right like it 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 is a it generates these kinds of questions in its openness i think yeah i totally i lo I, I totally agree and i think that that um that that quote that you just mentioned actually is in confetti like mm. in the very beginning and i and i i like it for the fact that one of the reasons that i i put it in there is because it it has that thing in it the looking and eating feet mm. upon light like what that's so strange you know uh, to eat light um what like and of course we do through like whatever our food but mm. but there is this um i think i think one way to think about ve and like mysticism for me anyway and what i tend to do in my work is like well okay how is this like sort of uh, changing how how our relationships uh, in terms of screens and distance and proximity and the collapsing of of distance and proximity like how does that sort of sort of off some possibilities but also potentially create like new uh, ecstasy or mysticism for better or worse you know um, and so yeah I mean I guess like to answer the question I'm sort of like uh, there uh, she she figures in confetti via light but also exactly what Nina said the, the feeding upon light and so this like strange combination between eating and um, or strange combination of eating and looking and so in the book there's a lot of like high materials like like celestial light and also very low materials like confetti when it falls to the ground bodily fluids etc very cool well I, everyone seems to agree that she got more popular after her death she wasn't that well known uh that well acclaimed uh, during her actual life but but it seems to me and this could be confirmation bias but she seems to be making a bit of a comeback right now as well uh, uh emily why why simone Vey now um <laughs> uh 
I don't know. I mean, I think I agree. I I was working on this book for like maybe five years on and off. And about halfway through, I was like, wait, she seems to be sort of trending and like being memed and things. So all of a sudden she was quite popular and I don't actually know why, but I think maybe one reason would be um, because we need her, as Nina was saying, you know, uh, I think this idea of like taking sides or the um, sort of subscribe, you know, re the way that we read people now, right? Like sort of, oh, they're like a good person because X, X, Y, or Z person says so, or because of I saw this online or whatever, or they're a bad person for this or that reason. You know, so everywhere in Simone Weil, that is like totally squashed because she asks us to read or she she sort of has this whole thing about reading people and paying mm -hmm. attention and that you know force you know forcing others to read us she says something like this forcing others to read us the way we read ourselves is like a wrong way of reading um, it's an interference and also forcing sort of reading others sort of forcing our reading of others upon them is also a kind of uh, terrible way to engage. So I think with like social media and the internet and all, all of these sorts of auto automatic ways we read each other, um, she has a way of like slowing that down and creating some kind of resistance or like texture. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If, to me, like there's a slipperiness to things now and there's this sort of clicking, yeah, yes or no. And she resists that. And I think e she even sort of trouts asks us to reconsider like what philosophy is you know she for her like philosophy is very rare <laughs> it's like this sort of it's not like you're ever going to get answers or um you know for for her i think plato was a kind of mystic almost um yeah. i don't know if that answers your question <laughs> oh, no it does a, a, a thousand percent that, that's really awesome um uh, nina do you the uh, why they now yeah, I, it's kind of slightly tricky to answer. Other than I, you know, I think I know, I looked at um, you know the 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 some of the draft of Emily's poetry uh, collection, which I recommend. Also, Hi I, uh, Hyperidean Press, you know, are doing some very interesting work. They put out a book by Adam Lehrer, and you know, there's 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 a lot of kind of very um, cool independent stuff happening in poetry and in you know outside of the mainstream type type work, and I. Yeah, I mean, what comes to mind also, I guess, is the work of someone like Angelicism 01. Um, so there are various people who are trying to think through, I suppose, what it means to live uh, online <laughs> or in the age of the internet from a poetic point of view. And I, and I think precisely is the way uh, Emily was saying, like the, that they um, perhaps hints at a way of, of reconsidering um, theological and mystical and philosophical questions and, and questions of light um, in particular maybe um, in an age where and reading and what it means to read you know and, and, and Angelicism 01 is, is really obsessed with this idea of, of that we, we live in a post reading age you know that, that um, actually nobody's reading anymore <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, in you know in almost like a machinic way you know there's it's not just that there's too much text it's that you know the it's almost like the internet reads for us you know and that and that we therefore all we have to do is all we have left is maybe judgment uh, these judgments about people lists you know blah, 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 like the you know we're, we're almost been made binary code you know by the by the by the system um and i suppose they maybe um yeah, pre presents uh, a ways into understanding our condition um, and points towards other ways of getting away from. I mean, even things like the touch grass meme, you know, like this idea of people spending too much time online and you have to go outside. And, you know, to read Vey, who, who oscillates, you know, wildly between these kind of grandiose, you know, heightened claims of, you know, like, like you can kind of always imagine her like not eating for three days and then like writing these kind of crazy things and she's in this sort of state. But then combining that with these sorts of very, very immediate practical questions of like physical labor, like how to get away from the ego, how to kind of dissolve the self. Um, and, and maybe in that sense, she's a kind of precursor for, for the internet age somehow. And maybe that's why. Awesome. Well, I, I think that's a, a, a great place to to wrap up. Uh, Emily, give us give us your plugs. Oh, um, yeah. My website is just my first and last name, uh, 
my name is spelled weird, but um, should be like here. Yeah, there, there it is. <laughs> yeah, um, for those yeah. listening in podcast form, it'll be in the show notes. <laughs> and um, I guess, yeah, I have a Substack, uh, and then also Hyperidian Press. You can find you can find confetti there if you're like into that kind of thing. Very, very cool, uh, Nina. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm currently doing a lot of work for Compact Magazine, which is a new, I'm an editor of this new um, publication, which is um, based in New York, but we cover lots of different things. Um, and we're trying to, yeah, I mean, in a, in a sort of Bay-like way, although not very mystical, but we are trying to uh, bring together people from different political and religious persuasions um, to try to break the deadlock of the, you know, these these sort of oppositions, which I think are, are largely meaningless, but are obviously dom very ideologically dominant. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm very I'm always interested in dialogue between dis disagreeing parties, I guess. And so, Compact Magazine is is part of that, and I feel very I'm very proud to have been asked to to work with them, um, and I have a lot of respect for my uh, my colleagues, Sora Bamari and Matthew Schmitz. Um, and so I'm largely doing that, but I also have a Substack which I periodically update with, it's just my name, Substack, and there I tend to do more like curious, slightly heightened poetic things, <laughs> which are just uh, not for anything. It, it, again, this is very important, I think, if you do a lot of writing to have writing which is not for things that has no form or necessary telos. Excellent, excellent. And, uh, my plugs are mylandmeditation.substack.com every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Montreal time. Uh, free, open, online meditation. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be anything. Come and check that out. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by the Joe and I Church. They got a great free course at joeandite.org slash learn on the Joe and I tradition, on the history of Joe and I Gnosticism and mysticism. It's a super fun course. I recommend checking it out. And uh, that's it. Uh, Nina Power, Emily Russo, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks, John. Thank you.